We welcome those that are joining us online. I don't know, man, I don't know about you, but coming out of coming out of something like that, it's I'm revved up, ready to go. Would you turn to Matthew chapter five? Matthew chapter five. We are in part two of the blessed life. The blessed life. It's the Beatitudes. Jesus shares in chapter five these eight characteristics of what does it mean uh, to, to receive the blessings of God? What does it mean to walk in the kingdom, to live in his kingdom? It's a little counterculture than, than what we might what we might think. And so we see that Jesus gathers these disciples around him. He sits down, takes the place of a authority as he begins to teach. We looked at the first beatitude or the first characteristic last week. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. But the kingdom of heaven is, is theirs. And it's interesting the Greek word where the word poor comes out of is literally translated beggar. It's this complete desperation for, for him. Blessed are those who are poor and realize their need for the Savior. And then the second point that Jesus makes, the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, to mourn means to feel or express grief, regret, or sorrow. There's not a person in the house, there's not a person online that has never not felt grief at one point or another. And so Jesus knew that those listening, he knew that those listening would understand grief because anyone alive has experienced loss. And so he begins, blessed are those who mourn. We're focusing on that and then we'll go to, for they will be comforted. Mourners hear in, in this context refers to the repentant, those who grieve over sin. Now again, Jesus is teaching this message of repentance. We see that in chapter 4. John the Baptist began this message in chapter 3 as the forerunner of Jesus. But well before this era, if you will, the Old Testament is filled with this call to repentance. Every Old Testament prophet, every man of God who spoke on behalf of God to the people of God, they were calling the people back to repentance. And so it's fitting that Jesus would continue this as he is talking about what does it mean to live in the kingdom? What does it mean to be a part of the, the kingdom, to walk in the kingdom? Blessed are those who, who mourn over their sin, grieve over their sin. The main idea today, if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write this down. We can never experience the blessed life until we realize we are sinners in need of Christ the Savior. The, the moment we think we got this, God, I'll, I'll, I'll call on you when I need you. <laughs> Those are the very moments that Man, we hit, life hits and hits hard. Has anyone ever experienced those, those moments before? It's a desperate need, a daily need for, for the Lord. And so if we're going to truly be comforted, which we'll get to in a moment, if we're going to truly be comforted, then it starts with that place of mourning or grieving, repenting over our, our sin, because it's only in that that we realize that we need the Savior. Tim O'Carroll can't save himself. You and I can't save your, your, yourself. The standard of salvation is perfection. And all, we all were born into sin and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus Christ is the only answer to forgive us of all of our sins. Save us from our sins. It's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. 
And so when we pause and we meditate on, on the truth that we are fallen creatures, it leads to sorrow and, and regret. And that I'm a fallen creature, that I've, that I've missed it because of, of sin, it leads to a place of sorrow and regret. Then we realize that we were made in the image and likeness of God, lived in paradise, the Garden of Eden. It was God's original design for us. And we compare that to our present state, the present state, the broken state after the fall, the sinful state of humanity. One can only mourn our present condition. James chapter 4, would you write this text down? James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, period, pause. Before we look to anything else, submit to God, that word submit is not a, it's not a popular word. Uh, it's not a popular word in the marriage. <laughs> it's not a popular word at, in the workplace. It, it's not a popular word, you know, some of y'all running for some police. <laughs> it's, it's just not a, it's not a popular word, but it's a necessary word. How can we receive salvation without submission? It cannot happen. We submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever confesses that he is Lord, that you're no longer master, you're no longer boss, that he is master, that he is boss. Therefore, submit to God. Submit to God. Scripture continues, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Within the context of verse 7, how do we see the attacks of the enemy the enemy is so cunning. We talked about that several weeks ago, the, the attacks of the enemy, to be prepared for the attacks of the enemy because they're coming and they're coming in hot. They're coming in when you least expect them. Uh, and even when we do expect them, the enemy is coming. And, and, and so how do we resist? It starts with submission to God. Submission to God. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That temptation that's before you, that keeps catching your eyes and keeps catching your, 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 your attention, your, your, your mind, consuming your thoughts. Resist the devil. We have to turn from that temptation. And we see here, he will flee from you. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I wonder, how close are you to the Lord today? I wonder if there's been any distractions or hindrances in your life this week that have caused a little, little bit of a gap. And I want to be very clear that the Lord is present. He's faithful. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will never turn his back on us. We can have great confidence in who our God is, that he is always present but the reality is there's moments that we make decisions that would draw us away from him and his plan and the path that he has for us. And James is reminding the church, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then he says this, cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now again, this, this isn't the fluffiest part of the message here. Uh, this isn't the, I, I feel really good, but it's, it's important that we realize that there's sin that's present and uh, we need to go to the Lord, surrender that sin over to him. This fellowship be restored to be reminded that he is close so that we don't follow the evil desires that are part of the old person so that we're living in the new person. Paul tells us that we're new creations in Christ Jesus. And James tells the church, cleanse your hands, sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable. I mean, hard, harsh words. Be miserable and mourn and weep. When it comes to sin, this is our position. This is our position. It brings miser misery. It should bring mourning. It should bring weeping. And then he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord. What, what does that look like 
in your life today? What is humility? What's the gauge of humility in your life today? And going back to last week, Jesus begins poor in spirit, that place of humble desperation, that place that all we have, God, is th this, and, and I surrender it all over to you. Have your way. Take me and use me for your glory. I humble myself. I can do nothing apart from you. Those are Jesus' words. That's what humility, humility speaks. I can do nothing apart from the Lord. See, mourning in this context is called a blessing. Don't miss this. Bless are those who mourn. Mourning in this context is called a, called a blessing because mourning our fallen nature creates in us a desire to do what is right. I'm no longer doing what is wrong. No longer pursuing the old person. I'm, I'm doing what is right. I want to strive for righteousness. I want to strive for godliness. I want to strive for Christ like this. I pray that's the, the desire of your heart. And if, isn't to, if it isn't today, before you leave this place, before this worship gathering closes, make that des the desire of your heart. God, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. I want to live for, for you. The scripture continues that they will be comforted. They will be comforted. By who? The comforter. The comforter. The root meaning of the word mourn is to mourn over death. Mourn over death. Talking of surrender here. The death of ourselves can be sad in, in many ways. No more living for myself. No more serving me and my affections or my desires. Death to all of that. But according to God's word, here's true comfort. Not the temporary frustrating, short-lived kind of comfort that the world offers, but everlasting, deep-running, never-changing comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Would you write that reference down? Scripture says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. Godly Grief, godly mourning, godly sorrow leads to, to life. But worldly grief leads to death. Today, sin is not grieved. Uh, it's not deplored. It's not even merely tolerated. Sin is celebrated. Our society doesn't mourn sin. Psalm chapter 51, would you turn? Psalm chapter 51 is a prayer for restoration. It's a response from King David to the Lord after he's mourned. But before that, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the Lord uses Nathaniel to call out his brother David. And I, I don't know about you, but it's important that we have brothers or sisters around us that will call us out when we need to be called out. That will hold us accountable when we need that accountability. It's important. We're going to be launching discovery groups next week. And one of the things I love most about these groups is there's that piece of accountability. That as you move from rows to circles, you get to know people. And it's a lot harder to continue a facade as you get to know people, as you spend hours upon hours with people. And David needed this accountability more than he knew he needed this accountability. And you and I, we need this accountability more than we, more than we know we need this accountability. It's humbling. It's humbling in a world full of pride where ego can, can start to rise within each of us. There's not one exempt. We need people in our lives that will hold us to the fire. Hold us to the standard, which is the word of God as the authority for our lives. Does what our, how we live and how we conduct ourselves, is it matching to this word of God? And so the Lord uses Nathaniel to call out 
King David, after he's committed these sins, if you recall the, the, the story, King David should have been out to war, but he stays back. Goes on top of the roof, looks over, sees a naked woman. He wants her. He's the king. He moves in, sleeps with her. He sends her husband to the front line, essentially murdering him. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a spiral effect. And often that's what sin is, right? With all of us. And so Nathaniel uh, comes to him and presents this uh, scenario. And uh, David's response is, that man needs to die. <laughs> and Nathaniel looks back at him as a brother says, you are that man. And then look at this response in Psalm chapter 51, verse one, be gracious to me, God, do, do, listen to his first, I mean, the first out the gate, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Do, do you see that David makes this very personal? He doesn't push the blame. Ah, she was naked. I just wanted to get some fresh air. No, no. Uh, he makes this very personal. He owns it. And if we're going to move forward in this life and live for the glory of God and find freedom in the areas that have held us back, then we must own our sin and surrender over to him to the Lord. Completely wash away my guilt. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse three, for I am conscious of my rebellion. I know what I've done is wrong before you. And my sin is always before me against you. Do you hear it in verse four? Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right. When you, when you pass sentence, you are blameless. When you judge, indeed, I was guilty when I was born I was sinful from my mother when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity. Do you see that? In the inner self. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with, with hyssop, this, this, this Old Testament way of purification. And I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy in gladness, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. Listen to verse 10. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What a prayer. Owning the sin, not pushing blame, owning acknowledging the grace, mercy, love of God, the restoration that comes from, from him. Even verse 12, restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Restore the joy. Restore the joy. After the mourning, after the grieving, after the death to the sin, restore the joy within me. Given the promise of comfort, Hear clearly today that God is near the brokenhearted and will comfort those who mourn. Psalm 34 verse 18 says the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. He's near the brokenhearted. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, all comfort. He comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Paul acknowledges that God is the God of all comfort. He's the only one that brings that true, lasting comfort. He comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort others in theirs. This is important as the church. It's so important to understand that there's no wasted season in any of our lives. That God, through his grace and mercy, 
even though there are decisions that we make that have put us in these positions and we've gone through certain circumstances in our lives, but somehow God in his beauty, in his master design, in his redemption, he takes all that we've gone through and he's able to turn a mess that we have made into a beautiful message for his glory. This is what he does. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, our griefs are blessed for they are our points of contact with the divine comforter. Do you hear that? Our griefs are blessed. Those moments of mourning, for they are our points of contact with the divine comforter. Our mourning hours, our grieving hours have brought us more comfort than our days of mirth or gladness. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 says, And when you were dead in your trespasses, And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. Do do you hear the truth of the word today? You and I, all of us, were dead in our trespasses of sins. And sins, there, there was no hope. There was no hope. But we've been made alive, not because of any good works that we could ever accomplish, but because of Christ Jesus, we have been made alive That's the resurrected king is resurrecting you and I. He erased, verse 14. He erased the certificate of debt with with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Paul uses this beautiful imagery, this illustration of in, in this time there would be Debt would be exposed. It would be in the forefront for the town to see. In the town center, their debt would be posted for all to see. And and what Paul's encouraging the church here in Colossae is that you were dead, but you've been made alive. You had a sin debt that you could never pay off, but Christ Jesus has paid it in full. Verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. And hear me clearly today. There is victory in Christ Jesus. There is victory over death. There is victory over separation. There is victory over sin in Christ Jesus alone. The Sermon on the Mount cannot be separated from its speaker, the chief communicator, Jesus. Jesus mourned over many sins, but never once did he mourn over his own sin because he didn't have any. Ultimately, our comfort, listen, is anchored in the reality that Jesus doesn't just mourn sin He conquers it. He conquers it. He invites us then into this radical countercultural reality, the the upside down kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and then dies in our place so we can enter it. In 1873, this hymn was written, titled It Is Well, and, and listen to one of the stanzas. My sin... Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. We sang the chorus of this hymn that was written in 1865. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. As we close today, I want to ask that you consider the goal of the Christian life. Think about this for a moment. What is the goal of the Christian life What is the goal of Christian living? What is the purpose as a part of the new creation? What is the goal of the Christian life? 
I don't know what thoughts come to your mind. But as I read through the scriptures, there's only one thought that comes to my mind. The goal of the Christian life is to bring glory to God. That's the goal of the Christian life. It's to, it's to bring glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, For you were bought at a high price. You and I were bought at a high price. So glorify God with your body. That's what Paul is telling this, this corrupt church in Corinth. They've allowed the culture to creep in. They're going astray. They're doing all these things that are against the word of God. And he's saying, no, no, no. You were bought with a high price. Glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your life. What does this look like for you today? Are you living a life that brings glory to him? Does a lost world see an alive Jesus in you? Starting right here, does, does the church see Jesus alive in you. The, the point of this life is, I believe with everything in me, to bring glory to God. So how can we accomplish this? If we're, if we're living for self, how, how can we accomplish this bringing glory to God if we're, we're serving our selfish desires, if we're consumed by sin, Blessed are those who mourn and are repentant of their sin. They will be comforted. I want you to hear today as we close that the king who comforts is here. He's alive. Whatever it is that is weighing you down, would you surrender it over to him today? Would you trust him? Or would you live for his glory alone? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment in the house and online with us? Would you take a moment to consider your life? Con consider your life just for a moment. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What do people see? Maybe you've even done a good job of hiding. Oh, you can only hide for so long. And besides, the God we serve sees everything. <laughs> There's nothing hidden to him. And so, what is your response today? Is there sin present in your life that's hindering you from living for the glory of God? Today, would you surrender it over to him? Would you surrender it over to him? As people are praying all across this place, praying online with us, if there's someone here that has never received the gift of salvation, I want you to hear today that it is available because Jesus Christ conquered the grave as people are praying, you're alone with the Father, considering your life. I wonder if this is your decision for salvation today. Would you confess that Jesus is Lord? Meaning he's master, he's boss, you, you no longer are running things. <laughs> you surrender it over to him. And then would you believe that God raised Jesus from the grave after the first the 9 a.m. today a, a young girl walked up with her father he said I want to be baptized and I said why would you want to be baptized he said because I've made Jesus 
loss of my life. <laughs> I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I trusted Jesus as my Savior. How oh, is so precious. Salvation is available today. And if that's your desire, would you surrender it over to him? Would you thank him for saving you? We're going to sing this song. It's a newer song. Points to Jesus and in all his glory, full submission. There's only one king, and it's Jesus. And as we sing this song, there's going to be men and women in the house, in the different corners, here at the front that would love to pray with you. There's a host online that would love to pray with you. We don't want you leaving this worship gathering without settling anything, without surrendering it all over to him. Is your decision today for salvation? Is your decision today for rededication, recommitment? Is there some sin that's weighing you down that you would just surrender it over to him? God, give me the strength because you are the overcomer. Would you stand to your feet and would you move as the Spirit of God leads you to move today? There's men and women that would love to pray with you, greet you, whatever your decision might be. We want you to know you're not alone. We are discovery. We stand with you. That's the beauty of the church. Would you move as the Spirit of God leads you to move today?